Well, that's good. I mean, we were talking a little bit about police typing. So much of the book seems to be about people's snap judgments and misapprehensions of one another. If you've ever been to a wedding and just sort of like frisbee, you know, just like your, your frisbee of judgment, where you're like, what an asshole. I like there's a Simon when he first sees, there, there are a lot of actors in addition to therapists. There are a lot of sort of performance artists and actors at this wedding. And there's like Trevor, who's a superstar boyfriend of this woman, Miranda, a uh, sister-in-law. Um, who's just like square jawed. I think uh, the narrator refers to him as a box store, right? Or Simon thinks of him as just as a box store, like King, King Generic. Um, and some people sort of deepen beyond these stereotypes, and some people you sort of think, no, that it's more complicated in Lisa's hands. It's not just sort of like I'm going to upend these stereotypes. It's sort of like let's think about how narrowly these middle class people, let's think about the, the poverty of the raw materials that they have uh, to make themselves. But this is also a long winded way of just asking about you know, if you want to talk about just about the role that profiling or typing plays in this book for you. We talked about categories of judgment. Um, just the way everybody from the police force to the therapists are looking for language to kind of type people, make them safe, you know, fit them into some slot. Um, well, the kind of hero of my book is this therapist named Helen, who is um, unlike you. Um, y you have you seem to me to be a writer who has like a golden age that you write about. I mean, I think, uh, I think you write about childhood in a really magical way, and also the movement out of childhood. And it, there's this like kind of fairy tale weirdness uh, uh, about the way you remember childhood. Well, whatever I write about the person is the age I am. I have very little imagination. So I wrote um, dating novels, and then I got to be 40, and I had a kid, and I wrote a book about a 40-year-old with a kid, and now I'm in my 50s, and the hero of my book is a middle-aged woman. Go figure. <laughs> you know, so, uh, but... Not a vampire, it's so weird. <laughs> I didn't think of that. That would have been a good twist, you know. Uh, oh, yeah, you're a terrorist? Well, <laughs> we'll have to collaborate with you. And the sequels. But I can, but I can spin silk out of my tuxedo. <laughs> Uh, uh, and I'm like, yeah. So anyway, there's this woman, and she's very intuitive, and um, she's actually trying to figure out what this woman is up to. And then you've got everybody else who has a kind of template of evaluating people. Cops do, shrinks do, negotiators do. Everybody is encountering you and thinking what they know about you before you say a word. And I know it's easy to call that overgeneralizing, but that is how we encounter people. You know, we kind of look at them and we decide what, who and what they are. So there's a novelist in this book who's a bit of an asshole, as many of the novelists, male novelists I know are. Uh, you know, he's just kind of full of himself and, you know, just tonally wrong all the time. And every remark he makes is inappropriate, and by the end of the novel, um, somebody beats him up. And, uh, you know, but, but what if he told his side of the story? You know, so part of my interest was what you see of people when you're when you don't know them, and then what you see of them when you get their stories. So, mm -hmm. should we take questions now? I think we've blabbered enough. Can I ask you one more question? I okay. One more question. Okay. So this, it's apropos. Okay. <laughs> um, so this woman in the novel, it's it's, it's Tessa Gabe who are having this marriage. Yeah, they don't matter at all. Just by the way, they actually don't really matter. Yeah, and it's, it's a, part of the heartbreak of the book is like Helen who I think of as like a secret heartbeat, a hero of the book, kind of like the moral center of this therapist, who's, as opposed to the other billions of therapists who are just like, you know, blinded by ego. She's very intuitive. She wouldn't be clear from a layover. She's very intuitive, can read people really well. Um, but she's thinking with sorrow. You know, she's the mother of the bride, and she's like, my daughter has been upstaged on her special day by all of these assholes, right? Um, much, yeah. All these assholes. So one of the things that she, that the mother or the bride uses at a certain point, she feels some ambivalence about this marriage, which in some ways is a very traditional marriage. You know, it's ironic, you know, they're they're they're, they're wised up. They know that marriage is a silly institution, but also there's this. She calls it an inconsistent belief system, uh, whereby her child is, is desperate to have, you know, like a white wedding, like a traditional wedding. All of the this woman has like more step parents. There's like 50,000 step parents and step kids floating on this novel. The institution of marriage has worked out for a few of the adults in her life, right? 
So everyone's sort of wondering, like, what makes it attractive? So I was just going to ask you very generally, you know, anything you want to riff on this, but just sort of like, why do they? Why do these people keep coming back to the institution of marriage? Like, are we so hardwired for monogamy? Is it kind of a sham? I left your book. I didn't like, say anybody was hardwired for monogamy. No, and I left. But I left <laughs> this would have made the book to make that case. Nay, <laughs> nay, that's true. Right? But I left the book feeling there's so much tenderness within it, and I sort of felt pretty optimistic about love between two people by the end. But that's because you're you. Well, that's true. <laughs> well, <I'm good. laughs> So I don't know why do you think that institution is still attractive to so many right now. <laughs> I think it's like having children. You know, it, 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 you see other people's children, and you just don't believe that you're going to have the experience of parenthood that they have. Your children aren't going to scream. Your children aren't going to act up. They won't become teenagers who smoke dope in I your own um, kitchen. <laughs> you know, I, I just think that um, that yeah. That's like when Kent and I went on that like water world ride and we saw everybody else drenched and miserable and we're like, but we won't get wet. Let's get on that inner tube. Exactly. <laughs> it's super fun. <laughs> I see. So there's some sort of like, yeah, we don't have a lot of ideas maybe. It's, it's a, an imaginative failure. Like, well, I'll try again. Round four. Didn't work those first three times. But I ran out of ideas. <laughs> Well, we that wasn't much of an answer. That wasn't a great answer, yeah. Well, I had a ring in my pocket. I was going to propose to Lisa here. But I'll just have to take questions and see how she really feels about marriage. Um, yeah, does anybody have questions for either of us? Yeah? Karen, how did you approach the challenge of writing the uh, alternating chapters? Uh, you know, going from Kiwi to Ava and then Diana. Yeah. Um, in my mind, it was so beautiful, sir. It was like this DNA helical, like exact, you know. Um, so I think part of the challenge of revision was like, my editor would be like, why is Kiwi at that party for 50 pages? <laughs> you know, it's just like a bad dream where it's like, Kiwi reached for the beverage. <laughs> like, more pages. He thought a million thoughts. <laughs> Hero for <laughs> yeah. yeah, he felt so many feelings. I mean, I think part of revision is sort of contracting that and figuring out what should be seen. And what should be somewhere and I really wanted those stories to have some kind of correspondence, right? So thank God I had a really good agent and editor and we sort of figured out how to make that happen. Um, but it wasn't natural, right? I mean, it, it took a lot of time. And you didn't write them chronologically? You, you just No, I did write them chronologically did? and I did have a sense of, like a very vague sense early on of where I wanted to end up. And certainly of this hinge where Ava kind of goes through a door and the story, the story become something something different. Um, so I had that, but it was sort of like, you, you have to shake the Polaroid so it comes into focus. <laughs> it just took a while. So. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, are you ever going to say anything about alligators ever again? No. <laughs> no. no, Lisa, no. <laughs> no. And I'm done with alligators? <laughs> But do you find this with your SWAT stuff? Like, I learned a wealth about alligators that has no one, unless I go on Jeopardy, how will I ever profit from it? I'm like, who wants to know about their, their mating dance? No one. The answer was no one. So maybe you feel the same way. Like, don't you, like we, you could probably be a hostage negotiator now. I don't think so. Um, <laughs> nor could I be a herpetologist. But, um, I actually thought you'd be in a Lacoste shirt tonight. Yeah. yeah, all right, all right. I mean, it's, but my friend Rivka gave me this like alligator ring, which I wear because I love her. But secretly, I'm like, dogs, I don't love an alligator. Sometimes it's like a lizard. This happened with the wolves, too, where people would be like, you must love wolves. I'm like, no, incorrect. <laughs> I love television and my Swiffer. Like, I don't know. Like, wolves freak me out. <laughs> I don't know. More questions. <laughs> Um, yeah, just like, so I've, I've read St. Lucy's Home, and it's just such a specific world and a specific voice, and that's very distinctive, all the stories in that collection. So I'm just curious how, how you sort of came to that voice, came to that world. Was it something that was gradual, or did you kind of find like your imagination just automatically took you in that kind of direction? I think I'm going to go with like capitulation. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this way. What happens then when you go on like to q and A's like this, and you have the the option or opportunity to spin like this amazing genesis about like all your great choices. But I Silk think, comes out of your body. Yes, yeah, 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 it just comes out. I do think, I mean, I really, at a certain point, I was like, oh my god, all the stories in this collection are narrated by like wisecracking, effeminate males. I should probably try to write from an adult POV. 
So like, uh, there's a story about this Minotaur that pulls his family's wagon to the west, and if it was from his point of view, and his name was Jax, and it was terrible, and it was like about to become some allegory about like slavery. So thank God, like I think I just like figured out um, that I should trust the voice of his, that I was hearing these stories. And I mean, that it just felt. I think capitulation is the best word for it. I mean, that was at that time, right? That was the voice I was hearing these stories, and that was like the material I wanted to treat in that way. I like the metaphor, sorry. Okay. You see when you're being terrible from the minister's point of view? And also a slave allegory. <laughs> yeah. I was intrigued by how influential Ava and Kiwi's mom have a whole lot of us um, in Swampland. And I was wondering if you had that relationship with your mother or an experience where you faced the mothers. Yeah, I think so. I think so. My brother was in the back and I were just talking about like how we think of our mom as like the actual Virgin Mary sometimes. She's like deeply Catholic. And the Sunday school teacher, I saw her recently, she was telling her Sunday school class that demons are germs that cause mental illness, which I don't disagree with. <laughs> <laughs> She's a really special special person and very, very strong. So I mean I think if there's anything that's autobiographical in that novel, it's that that kind of um yeah, just her, just, I think that she, she's a really a uniquely strong force for the good, and I think um, there's something spooky and great about incarnating your, you know, your loved ones that way, so. What do you kill her off? Well, I do. It's not yeah. comfortable for a mom. I <laughs> 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 that's true. Well, easier to love which of us is not without ambivalence about our parents? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Glass houses, y'all. I don't know. <laughs> Did you um, decide to make the move towards writing a novel, or were you kind of pushed to do it? And the just wondering, like, how it felt making the like going into novel writing versus short stories. Yeah, and, Lisa was a good friend to me during that transition. It didn't feel so natural. I don't think I really wanted to do it. I was in graduate school and envious of all the people who had. You know, it was sort of like they had these committed relationships to worlds that didn't like collapse like tents on them after 14 pages. So I think I was really excited to try something longer, and um, that felt like the landscape to do it in. But I wouldn't say, you know, I mean, I had, a, I was really proud to be able to see the thing through. It wasn't. Um, Lisa and I were talking a little about like stru structure versus sentences, you know, and I think. So much of my pleasure is on the level of the line, so to scaffold something for that length of time was not necessarily the like the most natural or easiest. So. Yeah. Uh, Lisa, when you revise a novel, do you have certain criteria or processes that you always go through, or that you always? I mean, you go back and you first examine the structure and say, oh, great, the structure works, and then look at the characters, or... Lisa drinks orphan's blood. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've been teaching creative writing for 30, more than 30 years, and so I'm pretty, I'm pretty analytical about my own work, and also, I mean, there are a bunch of screenwriters in the room here, and one thing about screenwriting is that it forces you to strip away thinking just about the language and your, uh, your kind of commitment to the individual sentences and ask yourself what kind of story you're actually telling. So I make all my students do outlines. They think it's kind of tacky, but it's like you're looking at this chapter that's kind of flaccid and boring, and you're trying to say, why is this chapter here? What is this chapter doing? So I always get down to like almost a screenwriter's outline, and then I write um, this is going to sound very eccentric and kind of crazy, but I follow a 10% rule. I follow a rule that you can always lose 10% of what you've said. That 10% of it is just going to be roadrunner running over the cliff <laughs> and just blathering. And so if you cut away the 10%, then you can see more clearly what's not there. Because I think what happens to you when you're writing is that you get so kind of caught up in the forward momentum of your creation that you can't actually see how somebody would come to the work who, and what they get out of it. So I cut 
then I try to add 10%, then I cut 10%, and then it's not so painful. So you're looking at 60 pages, and you have a project for the day. I'm going to cut six pages. Six pages here has got to be garbage. <laughs> and then you're also thinking about what is garbage about it. Like, what aren't you responding to? So that's kind of how I do it. So it's very um, untouchy-feely. Let's, let's say it that way. And you start with the sort of macro question and live up the, the plot and the structure and then focus mm -hmm. on line by line? No, I don't start with the macro, which is why I had to spend four years figuring out who the hell this woman was. You know? <laughs> but I mean, uh, those of you who are writers in the audience know how it feels to get to page 80 of a book or page 100 of a book and realize you have nowhere else to go. You know, that you've like spun to this point and then you're like, what the hell? Like I'm supposed to get 260 pages out of this and suddenly you're introducing, you know, a vampire. So I'm not criticizing <laughs> vampires. There are vampires there since the beginning. But, you know, you don't want to be working like that. Uh, so it's a vampire. Like Kentucky Free. <laughs> SOS. <laughs> So, you know, you need some idea of where you're going. And I work with students all the time who, you know, they're, they're writing their theses, they're, they're, they're finishing a novel. And the novel's 500 pages long. And you're like, what's it about? Well, I'm not sure. It's very complicated. <laughs> There's a lot going on. It has a real intensity. It's got many strands. No. What's it about? You know, uh, well, if it's about vampires, why is 200 pages on a hair salon? What do vampires have to do with the hair salon? Can we explain that? So, you know, I think you have to, when you're rewriting, not look at the page and just sort of answer in your head what you're trying to accomplish somehow. And often it's hard. Um, this is a question for both of you. Um, it's about MFA programs, and I know that both of you are related with MFA programs. And so I was wondering, you know, as, say, a young writer, because everybody's question is usually about themselves, um, uh, as a young writer, like, should someone go on to an MFA right away? Should they wait till they're a little older and are financially stable? Yeah, you know, like it could be anything. Like I, and then with that, does anyone, especially who's trying to write maybe say literary stuff, do they need an MFA? Is it necessary? You first. <laughs> um, well, I mean, if you can be paid to write for two years, three years, that's a good gig. Uh, I think the community does you a lot of good. I think the input does you a lot of good. What it doesn't do is guarantee you employment when you get out, and it's very hard to get published. And I think it's um, getting harder to get published. Uh, so, you know, it's not like you're getting a medical degree, and at the end you're going to be an orthopedist and crack some bones. I mean, you know, so as long as you can find a way... Offshore. Offshore. <laughs> Offshore. <laughs> Offshore. <laughs> if you can find a way to negotiate doing it for love and for self-enrichment with the hopes that you will get there. That's great. But you know, a lot of these MFA programs that fully fund their students, like um, you know, Wisconsin and Virginia and Texas. I mean, I'm friends with the directors of a lot of these programs. They get 900 applications for five spaces. So the five people who get into those programs are already like so close to where they need to be to publish a book. So, you know, Kevin Powers, who has Yellow Birds out, I mean, he went to Austin. He was fully funded for three years. Uh, I could name three or four other people like that. So, you know, you've already gone through some kind of selection process that gets you there. But I don't think that, you know, there are a lot of people online now saying, unless you're fully funded, don't go to an MFA program. I think that's wrong, too. Not everybody can be Kevin Powers. I mean, if you're that far along, you know, so, I mean, I think it can do a lot of good for writers who, who need a little push to really figure out what they're doing. Um, but there are a lot of programs. That's probably more of an answer than you wanted. But, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of them. Uh, and great work is coming out of our program, and it's really exciting to watch. Yeah, I'm a big fan, too, you know. I like George Rogers as his metaphor where he's like, you know, it, it just accelerates something that might have happened anyway, but it's like if you encounter some frozen pond, skate across it, you know? It just maybe happens a little faster than it would, and I think the community is a big part of that. I think having the luxury of that time is like the greatest gift. If that's really something you want to do, you can give to yourself. I do have a friend, like Lisa's saying, like, who's like, 
He was like, ah, I took out a mortgage on an imaginary castle. <laughs> and I think that's also true, you know? I mean, can't live in that castle. <laughs> Where's that castle? Why is Citibank still hitting you up for that money? But so that's something to think about. Um, but I don't think that, um, you know, I personally have an excellent, excellent experience in my MFA program. And um, so much of it was just seeing what other what other writers were up to, getting to see that stuff kind of in utero and see how they were developing it.